jeepers! You're listening to Smash or Pass! Hello everyone, welcome back to another interview on the JB and Millie channel. I am JB and joining me is Millie. Hi! And we have Dan. Hi. And the special guest who will be interviewing today is Mr. Christopher Keenan. Thank you so much for joining. My pleasure. Happy to be here. Thank you so much. So I do appreciate you being here and there's a lot that I'm really excited to talk to you about and I think going towards the start, at the start of your origins with both Warner Brothers and the Scooby-Doo franchise, so I can see on IMDb and everything that you were the Senior Vice President of Creative Affairs at Warner Brothers. So what were the kind of events and factors leading up to that point for you? Well, um, I'll tell you, um, but first let me start with my connection to Scooby-Doo. Um, when I was growing up, there were basically three channels on which you could watch cartoons, and most of them were on Saturday morning with some of them you know, in syndication in the afternoons. Um, but for me, Saturday morning Scooby-Doo was, was uh, appointment television. You know, it was my favorite show by far. Um, I... I wasn't an enormous cartoon fan across the board. In other words, I wasn't obsessive about any particular show. Um, but the things I loved about Scooby-Doo um, then remain true today. And I, I give you that context because um, working at Warner Brothers, it was sort of a passion and a dream of mine to work on Scooby-Doo uh, when the acquisition of Hanna-Barbera occurred at Warner Brothers. Um, but I'm, I'm getting a bit ahead of myself. Let me, let me back up a little bit just to, to explain how I ended up at Warner Brothers. Um, when I moved to Los Angeles uh, in the late 80s, um, I had recently graduated from college. I was interested in working in theater um, and to some degree working in television, but my passion was theater. And I got a job um, at a theater in downtown Los Angeles as what they call a reader, uh, where I worked for the literary department. Once a week, I would go pick up a giant stack of scripts, and then I'd go home and read them and write script analyses and recommendations. Um, it literally paid $10 a script, and <laughs> it was an enormous amount of work. Um, and so I thought, uh, wouldn't it be great to get a some some sort of a desk job where I could sit and be paid hourly while I sat there and read my scripts. Um, and the first job I got in Los Angeles doing that was as a, what they called a security receptionist at New World Entertainment, which is now defunct, but it was a television and film company. Um, and I worked there for about a year. Basically, my job was to smile politely, press a button and let people in the door. And I could do that easily while doing my script coverage. Um, and in doing that, I met someone who uh, worked at Warner Brothers, and she mentioned that uh, she was just sort of in passing. She was the spouse of another executive there. And she mentioned that Warner Brothers was starting up a television animation division, and they may have a receptionist job there, and that Warner Brothers had great benefits, and I should check it out. So I did, and I landed the job as receptionist um, in the production office for Tiny Toon Adventures, which was the first animated series for television that Warner Brothers was going to produce. Um, and that, that opportunity um, kind of changed my life in the sense that um, it was a very small operation, and um, I... It was kind of baptism by fire. I got to know all the different roles within animation. I got to know everyone from you know Warner Brothers executives to the producers and the writers and the story editors and character designers and storyboard artists, background painters. I mean, everyone was under one roof and it was just a great crash course in animation. And it struck me that while I absolutely loved theater, there in many respects, um, animation was a lot like theater in the sense that all of the writers came from at that day, in that day and age, a lot of them came from um, improv um, and uh, and theater themselves, and the and animation itself was very much like putting on a play in the sense that you know people were creating the sets and other people were designing costumes and you know and the, and the storytelling was sort of always a heightened reality sort of theatrical if you will 
So it really started to appeal to me more and more. Um, but I, I finished my job at the theater um, and no longer was doing my scripts there. So I found myself with idle hands and I volunteered to type uh, the recording scripts for the production team. Uh, because in those days without computers, they were we were typing on typewriters and the format was different for recording than it was for storyboarding or you know scripting. Um, it was strictly dialogue only. And in doing that, I found myself, of course, reading the scripts. And I was an, a big fan of the writers in-house, but there was one script in particular that really bothered me. Um, and it, <laughs> in regard to what it was saying to kids about gender, um, and I couldn't help myself. And I wrote an essay called Substance and Responsibility, talking about the responsibility we as Warner Brothers on a show that was executive produced by Steven Spielberg, that was going on Fox Kids, the biggest network at the time, the responsibility we had to our audience. And um, I shared this essay that I wrote. It was only about a page, a page and a half, uh, with someone who worked in development at the time. And unbeknownst to me, they in turn shared it with someone at Amblin Entertainment, Steven's company, Steven Spielberg's company, and somehow it made it back to the vice president of the division. And one day she came walking in with this piece of paper and said, did you write this? And I was mortified because I thought, well, there goes this job. Um, and I said, yes. And she said, let's have breakfast and talk. And she took me out to breakfast and we talked and she said, you know, asking me about my education, about my background, about my interests, this and that, and why I was working there. and. She said, I'll tell you, if I could stay, uh, I mean, if I were to stay, what would I do at my ideal job? And I said, um, work in development. And she said, what would, and work with writers. And she said, what would that job be called? I said, supervisor creative development. She asked me how much I would get paid. I told her and she said, well, let's go back to the office and write that all down. And that'll be your new job. And all I could think of was I should have asked for more money. But <laughs> that said, um, that was the start of my development work at Warner Brothers, which eventually over, you know, another decade and a half led to various promotions. And I um, left, I mean, started as receptionist and left as senior vice president of creative, which was for many people, including myself, quite a, a feat um, within a corporate structure like that. Um, but during the course of, of my time there, I had the amazing opportunity to work with some of the most phenomenally talented people in the animation and kids business. I learned from so many different people um, and, you know, had just had a terrific time um, really getting to understand not just the development process or the creative process, um, but the production process and management and, you know, all, all the things that went with the role. Um, and eventually in 2005, when I left, I, I honestly can say I, I left with just enormous gratitude for, you know, the experience. Um, and, having had Warner Brothers under my belt, you know, opened the doors to to plenty of other things, um, for sure. Um, but um, when in 1995, I had left uh, briefly, I went and worked at Amblin Entertainment uh, as a story editor, came back to launch Kids WB, the Kids WB programming service of the WB network. Um, and I was the original uh, director of programming um, and I was responsible for, you know, the, working on various current series, the scheduling, all of that kind of stuff, working hand in hand with the on-air marketing team. It was really about getting the network off the ground and we acquired a bunch of the shows that Warner Brothers had produced previously for Fox. Um, so in its infancy, it was a combination of acquisitions and library product and you know, and all those th sorts of things that we could cobble together to make a competitive schedule. Um, but as we moved into the second and then the third year, uh, there was an opportunity to develop and produce new content. And when I'm trying to think of the timing for this, actually, I it was um, after 
it was so Kids WB um, and Warner Brothers was uh, and Kids WB were sort of one in the same Warner Brothers Animation and Kids WB. Um, but there was this sort of separation of church and state where it was decided that it would be in the best interest of both entities if there were different parties kind of running each. And so I returned full time to the animation side and another team was brought in to do the development and programming for Kids WB. And it was then that I pitched uh, What's New Scooby-Doo. I had been doing a bunch of direct-to-consumer videos, long-form Scooby-Doo videos, um, and absolutely loved them. They were my favorite project to work on all the time. Um, they, were, they were just so much fun. And when we had the idea of doing a series and talk to Kids WB, the pitch was really simple. Um, it was, it's Scooby-Doo the way you think you remember it. It's funny, it's scary, and the mysteries make sense. Um, because when I went back and watched a lot of the original episodes, they weren't as funny or scary as I remembered them being when I was, you know, seven. Um, and some of the mysteries didn't quite make sense. They they, they sort of made sense at, you know, uh, to some degree, but there were key pieces left out or it was a suspect that we didn't meet until five minutes before he was unmasked or that kind of thing where I was, I was you know, simultaneously very nostalgic about it. And also in my new role at Warner Brothers um, relative to when I was seven, very critical. Um, and so we, we pitched the concept and, um, and WB uh, bought it. They loved the idea of doing, of doing an all new Scooby-Doo. But it was really important to everyone involved. And as you might imagine, you know, it definitely takes a village. It was not me putting on a show. There was a whole army of people making this happen. And um, we all had great affection and reverence for the original. So it was a matter of trying to find the, the balance between reinventing it for a contemporary audience at that time um and you know upping the ante in terms of production value and all those things but we still wanted it to be scooby-doo and that was so important um so that's <laughs> that was a really long-winded answer to your first question oh no not at all it's just really good to get a kind of picture of how this went and it is absolutely incredible what you've just told us and a bit of a almost logistical question that i've got for you of course you've mentioned you know being the creative or uh, you know the vice president of creative affairs and all that but in terms of the scooby-doo projects going through the credits it's credited you as you know development and creative supervisor was that all encompassed within your role as you know the vice president of creative all those two separate roles entirely um and it's a great question, um, and I've since sort of worked to cor to correct that in my credits on subsequent productions. Um, one of the reasons that that credit exists, which is actually not a credit recognized by the Academy, it's not a credit recognized, you know, it's a very vague credit. Um, there was a lot of controversy at Warner Brothers um, at that time about whether or not a corporate executive could receive a producer credit. Um, and so at the time, um, I was not given a producer credit on any of the any of the shows on which I worked, um, which, um, you know, again, I'm very grateful to have worked on them. Um, but it is something that um, now I receive executive producer credit on everything that that I produce because and, and but in answer to your question it, it was definitely part of the job I will say of all the shows I've worked on I was more hands-on with Scooby-Doo uh, what's new Scooby-Doo than some others and that came out of two things one you know certainly my personal passion for it and because I enjoyed it so much um, but also because it was a relatively complicated series um as an example we had when we were looking for a story editor um sort of a head writer to to helm it um we you know cast a wide net and we, we ended up getting three very distinctly different pitches from three very different writers uh who didn't know one another 
um, named Jim Krieg, George Doty, and Ed Sharlock. And we loved, loved, loved things about each of, of the takes that they they came in with and the way they they pitched their their ideas. So we kind of took the unprecedented step at the time of hiring all three of them as a team and having them meet and, um, you know, sort of have a, a, a melding of the minds. Um, and they couldn't be more different as writers, as people, as, you know, they just, and their experience was completely different as well. It was the secret sauce of that series. The three of them, those three creative brains together um, just made magic, honestly. And they had such a good time with each other um, that it was contagious. So I loved going down and spending time with them. I loved reading their scripts. I loved talking about scripts and stories. Um, and it was also a challenge from a creative standpoint in that um, we were looking at ways of reinventing the characters to some degree, just as we we had sort of done with some of the direct-to-video uh, featured, animated features. Um, the characters themselves, I had in my head who these characters were based on my, I don't know, wishes when I was seven. You know, I sort of read the characters a certain way. And again, when you go back and watch it, they're not quite as... Um, um, comedic as I remember them um, or as they play out in my mind and so we we evolved each of them in a very specific direction and you know that was certain that was done to some degree in the videos but we were producing the videos and the series at the same time and a lot of this really came from George and Ed um, and Jim um, and frankly me I mean I, I, I'll just give you some very concrete examples um, Fred or Freddie um, was, you know, sort of the brawn of the operation, but he was played very much as sort of the straight guy to Shaggy and Stu Scooby's comedy throughout. But he himself didn't have a whole lot to do in the original. And he was just sort of, you know, earnest. And so we took the earnestness and pushed it as far as we could to make him just sort of the absolute Boy Scout, if you will. And you know, always believing people are good at heart. And, you know, everyone is innocent till proven guilty and very literal. Um, and we kept pushing it and pushing it to, because um, we wanted to have him be as extreme in that direction as Shaggy and Scooby were in their sort of, you know, comedic cartoony antics. And then the same became true for both of the women in the cast where, you know, Daphne was sort of known unofficially or behind, you know, closed doors as a danger prone Daphne. That was, you know, she was sort of damsel in distress. But at that time, um, you know, the Reese Witherspoon movie, uh, uh, Legally Blonde had come out. And this idea of a female character being uh, a heroine, um, but being a heroine through her sort of girliness, you know, there was absolutely nothing wrong with being being beautiful and 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 pink and frilly and fluffy and all of these things that went along with sort of traditional femininity um but totally embracing that and being empowered by it she could be strong and that and we kept taking that even a little bit further and added this sort of macgyver element that you know um in her girliness she's always got the right thing in her purse you know she just happens to have lipstick that can you know, make the ink appear or, you know, whatever, whatever it was. Um, and so that was an important evolution for her that she was a contributing member of the team that actually brought something um, of her own to this. Um, and, you know, Velma has always been, um, you know, the, the intellectual, she's always been the, you know, the smartest one in the room. Um, but she also was lacking any self-awareness or or any sense of irony or comedy. And so for Velma, we wanted to really push um, this idea that, that she was very self-aware of kind of her place in society and her place within the group. And she was very sarcastic and ironic. And we kept pushing her sarcasm and sort of her deadpan delivery of 
of lines in a way that perhaps wasn't intentional the first time around, but this time we wanted to make sure that she was sort of winking to the audience that she recognizes how absurd this situation is, you know? Um, so again, those were just examples of, you know, ways that in working with the writers and the, the directors, um, uh, we, we were really trying to just evolve what was there, take the seeds of what was there and grow it to a place where it would resonate more for, you know, a, a more sophisticated audience, really. And I think there were so many reasons that I see it as one of the most successful Scooby-Doo shows, certainly the one that's, you know, stayed as most prominent with me. And I think one of the reasons that came across quite clearly there as well is like you said, you did have a genuine passion for Scooby-Doo. So is it fair to say, you know, going into this, it was something you were very familiar with? Was there a certain series that perhaps was the one that you were most kind of well acquainted with or anything like that? Uh, well, well, you hit it on the, the head when you say the the passion was there for everybody and and it's rare when you work on something where there's truly a collective enthusiasm and energy and everyone shares the same goal everyone is as excited about what you're doing even the kids wb executives loved the show loved the characters and you know scott gerald's was one of um our episodic directors and i don't think you could find a more passionate Scooby fan on the planet. Um, you know, Chuck Sheets, who became our our creative producer, came from the animated primetime sitcom world. Um, and he he brought his own passion for animated sitcom telling, you know, that again, everybody was contributing something different um to the process, but it was such a labor of love for everyone involved. Um, right, you know, um, um, Rich Dickerson um, and Gigi Moroni wrote the the music and the theme song, which to this day I can't get out of my head. Um, and in fact, um, my then assistant, Tommy Wachowski, and I sang it at a company event. Um, so I have a particular fondness and attachment to the What's New Scooby-Doo theme song. But again, everything about it just sort of clicked and came together. Um, and... I would say the only thing that wasn't particular, doesn't particularly hold up is um, we tried to do what later episodes of the original series did, which was to introduce kind of celebrities, if you will, you know, look, it's Sonny and Cher, look, it's the Harlem Globetrotters, you know, who happened to get embroiled in a mystery. And there was a desire on uh, the network's part to have them be sort of, uh, hot up and coming talent um but not all of that talent actually came and went up so you know there's like obscure people that are like you know appear as guest stars and you'd be hard pressed to you know even find them by googling them today um that was the only thing that we were trying to be timely and if anything i think we dated ourselves well i think there was another element you touched on that was really quite I think impactful for this era as well, which is the character development, like the members of the gang, them actually getting more focus and story themselves, particularly for me. It's my favorite adaptation of Daphne. I absolutely love what was done with the character in that series. From, you know, you were said you were very familiar with this as a child. Was there any character in particular that going into this you were really excited to be working with? Um to be totally honest Daphne and Velma that they were they were the two that to me just had the most possibility for for evolving into really solid funny empowered characters you know they they just you know again all the seeds were there and it was how can we really nurture this and I gotta say the the performances the vocal performances of the voice actors completely made it. Um, Gray Delisle as Daphne was, she is now Gray Griffin, but at the time Gray Delisle was brilliant as Daphne. And I'm not sure if you've heard this story, but um, but Mindy Cohn playing, uh, playing Velma actually came about because uh, we had used the original actress on a couple of videos and then she wasn't available. Um, and we were we were literally sitting around brainstorming trying to think of you know someone who would have uh 
not necessarily a similar voice, but as as unique a voice as hers. And I said out loud, you know, in my head, I keep I keep hearing Natalie from Facts of Life. And everybody was laughing and saying, oh, Mindy Cohn. Yeah, I, you know, that that that's kind of the right. And then I believe it was Scott Geralds who ran into her at a dry cleaners right after we had had that conversation and said, hey, are you doing any acting, any voice acting? Um, but what's amazing is we this was literally like on a whim. Let's see if we can get Mindy Cohn. I don't think she'd ever done a voiceover um, job before. Um, I could be wrong, but I, you know, she wasn't known for voiceover by by any stretch. And now when I look back and think, oh my God, she's been doing that voice now for 20 years, longer than I, you know, it's, it's remarkable. It's like, it was, it was just, you know, over a coffee, we were like, who is that actress who was on Facts of Life, you know, and then boom, she's got a 20 year career. Pretty, rem pretty remarkable. Um, and I also have to say the, we had Frank Welker, the original Fred, original Scooby doing Fred and Scooby. We had Casey Kasem doing um, Shaggy. And, you know, those two are, are icons, you know, in the, in the Scooby world. Um, and I, I, you know, I was so honored to work with them um, and to, to, you know, on a weekly basis to just hear them do their magic. Um, the only thing that became a bit challenging was Casey was a very strict vegetarian. And as we were writing for Shaggy um, and Scooby, uh, he later in the process um, really did not want to record any dialogue that referred to them eating any meat of any kind. Um, and it almost went to the opposite extreme where, you know, they were eating veggie burgers and tofu pizza and all this stuff. Um, and that was all a direct result of working with Casey. It was more important to us that we continue to work with Casey than it was to, um, you know, in insist that Scooby and Shaggy eat beef hamburgers. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, as a vegetarian myself, I always liked that Shaggy was a vegetarian and what's new, so I appreciated it. Um, also, so I know we've touched upon your role within the industry, but um, how would you explain your role on the Scooby-Doo movies and shows to someone outside of the animation industry? Um, so I, I would say the, the best way to probably describe it is as a creative producer, and that's not to take away from any of the people who were creative animation producers on the show, um, but because I would oversee the creative animation producers as well as the writers, um, it, it was sort of being conscious of all, all parts of the production at all times, you know, in terms of the creative. Um, I had a, a colleague at the time who was head of production who made sure, you know, everything stayed on budget and on schedule. Um, but in terms of the creative, you know, that ultimately fell to me. Um, and it also fell to me to make sure the client was happy, whether it was Warner Home Video or, you know, in this case, Kids WB at the time um, and our in Warner International who was selling these things around the world. So every now and then there'd be you know, some snafu or some problem where I get a call saying you can't do this, you can't do that, or, you know, is it possible to put this WB Network celebrity in an upcoming episode, you know, that kind of thing. So, um, so to someone standing on the outside, I was basically responsible for what you were going to see on screen and getting it on screen, if that makes sense. Um, but yeah. I can't say enough, and I know your audience is well versed in animation. It is such a collaborative process, and there are so many people and teams involved. Um, I don't even for a second pretend to say it was my show, darn it, and I ran every like it was a team sport, boy, um, and an exhausting team sport, but worth it because to have to hear you guys that you loved it is just so satisfying. Um, because, you know, when you're in the throes of it, you're like, I hope we're doing this okay. I hope people will like it. Uh, you definitely did a really good job. And I think a huge fan favourite that I see just on social media amongst even just 
casual fans is obviously the cyber chase. Um, what was it like to work on that film? God, that the cyber chase was the first direct to video that I was involved with. There was one uh, just prior to that. Um, um, oh God, what was it? Witch's Ghost, I think. Um, I it was Alien Invaders, I think. Was it Alien Invaders? I'm yeah, pretty sure so. Cyber Chase was for anyway. It was it was very early days for me. Um, there was a different team that had come out of Hanna Barbera that did like the first and second movie. One of which had um, Scooby Doo and Zombie Island, I think it was called. Um, in that, the the monsters were real, and that was something that I to me was contrary to sort of Scooby lore, you know, like, yes, I got, I understood why it was being done. I, I understood that it was kind of, you know, I can just imagine how the process went, you know, like, what if the monsters were, we'll do Scooby, but the monsters are real, you know, and, and the people who did it were great people. Like I'm not been dissing any of them, but um, it just struck me as as messing too much with the formula, meaning, you know, just as I was saying, when everybody was approaching the series and these other videos, we really had to look at what the sort of tenants of Scooby-Doo were. What were the core ingredients to the brand? And part of it was the unmasking, you know, that it, it's it's you know, thanks to these meddling kids, the mystery is solved. And if the solving of the mystery is it's all real, by the way, that's not as satisfying to me. Um, but anyway, um, so I was met with a lot of criticism by uh, internally and externally um, for Cyber Chase because uh, people felt that it was going back to this idea of, you know, back to the idea that, you know, monsters aren't real. And ironically, um, in Cyber Chase, it is real. It, it like, it's a virus. It's a, I mean, a fantasy, but it is a, you know, and so <laughs> it was like, you couldn't win for losing, if you know what I mean. Um, but it was, there was a lot of experimentation on that one. Again, as it was the first one I was involved with, we were bending the sort of rules of reality quite a bit and involving a lot of fantasy or sci-fi, you could call it. Um, I'll never forget though, if you're familiar with Cyber Chase, you know, it's the, you know, the crazy computer virus and all the, the gang are going through these levels or totally different worlds are chasing this virus who looks like, you know, a lightning bolt. And, you know, the whole thing is just crazy. <laughs> and I got a note from um, someone who won't be named at Warner Home Video who said, um, you cannot have the gang riding on a woolly mammoth at the same time there is a tyrannosaurus as they did those two animals did not live in the same prehistoric era and i was like um you have no issue with the talking dog or the you know manifestation of a virus or them being inside a video game but you want to make sure that we don't misrepresent to you know of the different prehistoric eras and they're like that is correct <laughs> it's like um i don't even know how to respond to that note but um have, have you ever read the book um a martian wouldn't say that oh i'm not sure if i'm familiar with it. there's a great book called a martian wouldn't say that that was put together it was um a collection of network executive quote, quotes to producers and writers of television and it was in reference to the sitcom my favorite martian where a note from the network said a martian wouldn't say that about a particular line um but it was just it was a great it's a great collection of bizarre nonsensical uh feedback on what is clearly a fantasy or make-believe script um and that was the case with cyber chase that was the one concern well, it was also right. written by a, a guy named Mark Tarose who had never written for animation before, but was a huge Scooby fan. Um, so that was a lot of fun to work with him, too. Yeah, I think he went on to do quite a few others after, which is, which is amazing. 
And um, it's kind of interesting because we've spoken a lot about Daphne and Grey Griffin, Grey Delisle, and the cyber chase is especially noticeable in terms of that was her debut performance as Daphne. So I wanted to ask, do you have any memories about working behind the scenes of her at all, or in fact, like how she became Daphne in that sense? Um, you know, because the the way well, particularly at that time, the way we would record, um, they were almost without exception, or at least whenever possible, we would record as a, as a, you know, a, the cast as an ensemble. It would be done as sort of a, you know, theater play, if you will, and you've got everybody standing up in a row um, doing their thing. Um, Daphne actually, uh, uh, sorry, Daphne, <laughs> Gray actually audif auditioned and our voice director had worked with her before really recommended her she had such a likable voice you know it wasn't cutesy it wasn't um it wasn't uh too young too old it was just it was exactly what we had been looking for in terms of being you know appealing and and sort of lilting and and feminine sounding but she had some power to her and some strength and sort of you know you could picture her feet on the floor you know um the other thing is that, you know, as you may be aware, Gray is such an incredibly versatile voice actor that she could then click into, you know, Wicked Witch mode or, or you know, Little Girl mode or whatever. And you could have her play all these other supporting characters along the way. Um, but I and I did not know Gray. Um, I met her, you know, briefly a couple of times at events or this and that and certainly sat in um while there was recording going on oh that's where I was going to go um the way we would record is we would have the team there we would have the voice director slash um uh casting director present um all, almost all of the direction given to the actors would go through our our casting and voice director Colette Sunderman and in turn, she would be getting feedback generally from um, one of the writers would be there to kind of help guide um, one of the network executives. And then um, sometimes the producers, or excuse me, the director would be there since a lot of it was very visual. Um, and often I would be there or somebody from my team. And so we would funnel our comments or back and forth with them. So it was almost like getting to know someone through a one-way mirror, if you know what I mean, where I'm, you know, back in the booth and I would, you know, really witness Gray's performance uh, along with everybody else, you know, that, um, and that's a really long-winded way of saying, I, I watched that character evolve from Cyber Chase, you know, through, by the time we got to the series, you know, she was Daphne. Daphne was hers. You know, Cyber Chase, she was still sort of, you know, finding it as as we all were. Um, but by the time we were doing What's New Scooby-Doo, um, you know, and she would add ad libs and, you know, it, it just, it, that, that was so true for everybody. You know, they just sort of became those characters once they were in the booth. A hundred percent. And even, you know, to this day, she continues to be incredible as Daphne, one of our like favorite moments, like like the whole memory, like the whole of this year was meeting her because she actually came to, to England. And it's kind of rare to see people make the journey, but it was an absolute pleasure to, to meet her. But another thing that I wanted to kind of get into with the cyber chase is like a rumor that went around. I'm not really sure where I saw it, but apparently there was meant to be a level in the game or a sequence in the game where the Mystery Inc. gang would come face to face with live action counterparts. Do you know if there's any credence to this rumor and how that would have played out? There, there were a number of different um, levels or worlds that were debated and then eliminated for a ton of different reasons. As you might imagine, during the development process um you know there was a lot of, of spitballing going on where we'd throw ideas out there um to be honest i don't remember ever truly contemplating live action versions um at one point we did talk about um stylized uh sort of animated versions of them as in it's a scooby-doo level game um sorry um and for production's re reasons, we just decided not to do that. Um, 
but one of the things that as we were thinking about the different levels and worlds um again th at that time where th things were in the gaming industry are certainly a lot different than they are now um and so it was much more about um trying to showcase a variety of worlds in animation than it was really about a variety of games and so it was like you know, different genres, Scooby-Doo in, you know, Land of the Dinosaurs, Scooby-Doo in a sports theme, Scooby-Doo in other, you know, so it was more about showcasing Scooby-Doo in a different environment than it truly was about gaming. Because um, if you notice, you know, most of the, the levels that they go to, there's not really a game explained. We're just, you know, there we are and <laughs> better catch him. Um, uh, again, there there wasn't a lot of time um, to go in depth into any of the, the games. Um, I will share one little bit of trivia. Um, the, the friend that they go to visit named Eric uh, was um, named after my mother's dear friend in Florida had a son who cut our lawn, who was an enormous Scooby-Doo fan. And his name was Eric Stauber. And I promised him I would name a character in Scooby-Doo after him. And so there is Eric in, in Cyber Chase. And I think he's now, you know, in his, you know, late 40s with kids of his own. And I don't think anyone believes him, but it is true. Oh, my wow. gosh. Wow. <laughs> yeah, that is actually amazing. I've never even, even heard of that before. So thank you so much for sharing that it's just amazing i i love the cyber chase so much because for all it does stick out as as a first in many ways it's also a lovely bookend as well because that was of course the last scooby-doo movie produced under mook animation the last of um gene mccurdy's tenure as the vice president of warner rivers animation so what was it like to to be there to witness the transition between that era and then of course the next era um well, first of all, there was there was a lot of transitions at that time. Um, you know, Gene was the executive that I mentioned who uh, ran animation when I started and really sort of mentored me um, during, uh, you know, right up until she left. Um, she was an enormous influence on me and a, and a huge supporter. Um, and the thing that I really learned most from Gene, um, with hindsight, I, I thought a lot about this, but Gene had such a healthy respect for the talent involved you know while she was an executive um she was well aware of who made these shows great and um that's something that i really i learned from her and hope i've i've carried forward um and then when sander schwartz came in um you know sander is is an amazing executive in so many levels um but i learned so much from him about production and about the business of animation. Um, and he's probably one of the most well-connected animation executives on the planet. I mean, he's just phenomenal. Um, but there was all sorts of different corporate, you know, uh, mergers and takeover. You know, there was just a whole lot of stuff all going on. It was, you know, the WB was launching um, the, to, for Warner to have its own network. Um, so there was a lot of transition, if you will. Um, what with Scooby in particular, um, one of the great things was that Warner Home Video immediately saw, um, the potential for this, not as just, you know, a once every couple of years or what, you know, but really as, you know, an ongoing annual franchise. And it went from just sort of a pet project to, Hey, maybe this will work to like, they, there was a whole business to be had. And so we were, you know, for a good number of years, always in production on one while we were developing the next. And, you know, it was constant and doing the series. So, you know, I, I, I spent a lot of time thinking about, a lot of waking hours thinking about Scooby-Doo. Um, but, um, and we had different crews working on different things, uh, you know, whether it was a particular um, direct-to-video movie or the series, there was some overlap here and there, but, you know, the writers were different, the directors were different, the producers were different, um, the budgets were different, the studios were different, you know, there was, so 
Um, and then, you know, we had some cross pollination where we'd have, you know, a composer do this and, uh, you know, and, and, you know, maybe a director of this would do a director, uh, would direct on the series. So there was a little bit of, of sharing, <laughs> but it was truly the, when you talk about the, the transition, it was, it became like this renaissance for Scooby, you know, that, that we were just like, it was Scooby everywhere you looked, um, which was very, very cool. I mean, it certainly was an era where we were very spoiled for content because we got used to being able to have frequent Scooby-Doo movies as well as series kind of all at our disposal and in quite short succession, which we really wish we kind of had a little bit more of at the moment, admittedly. And um, I guess the next two movies to come along were Legend of the Vampire and Monster of Mexico, which reunited the original cast. Do you remember kind of if that was a conscious decision and at what point that was made? Um, it was definitely a conscious decision, um, and um, the the director on those uh, was um, Scott Geralds, and Scott, as I mentioned, is an enormous Scooby-Doo fan and was very, very, very much a purist. You know, he really, he grew up at Hanna-Barbera, you know, profession professionally, um, and, you know, was, was truly a, a student of you know, studying the original Scooby-Doo. Um, and he worked on both of those productions, um, definitely had an interest in getting the original cast. Um, and, you know, <laughs> um, we kind of did those right back to back. Um, and it's so interesting how, <laughs> how these come about. So uh, I don't know how much I'm allowed to say out of school, but so, the, the Monster of Mexico actually started as two completely different ideas. One was to send the gang to Mexico, and one was that I wanted to do um, Scooby-Doo meets Bigfoot. And so we compromised and, and made it Scooby-Doo and the Chupacabra, but the Chupacabra ended up basically being Bigfoot, not a Chupacabra, because I wanted to do Bigfoot. And so it would, people are like, what you know like it doesn't quite make sense um but um that was really important to me um that and i still wanted to do well we'll get to i, I was dying to do scooby-doo and the loch ness monster but we'll get to that one um and then the 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 vampire um story set in australia <laughs> um we did not want to set it in australia uh, we wanted to do a vampire movie but um, and Scott and I actually collaborated quite a bit on this because he really wanted to do this really cool sort of, you know, rock and roll vampire thing. But somehow it ended up being Australia because home video, you know, had a big market in Australia. And like, so it, it, talk about trying to serve many masters, you know. Um, and in some ways, I look back at them and think, well, it, like it's original you know you don't have a lot of vampire rock and roll stories sort of set in you know australia but um okay um but as we as we moved on sort of through the years they got a little bit more specific and we we had a little bit more power and not trying to, you know saying no we that we couldn't please all the people all the time with each individual title um you know the the loch ness monster being the one that uh was truly my dream come true because um, I'm obsessed with cryptozoology and uh, Loch Ness Monster. And I kept thinking, I had seen some show when I was a kid um, in which there was a, a version of the Loch Ness Monster. And all I remember of it, I was very young, was that it was a hoax and that it was someone inside pedaling a bicycle. I have no idea what it was, where I saw it, if I dreamed it. So when the producer, Joe Sitka, and I were talking about this, I said, I don't care how we do this, but someone's got to be pedaling a bicycle inside the monster. And he's like, but that doesn't make any sense. And the, you know, and he was really wrapped up in how could they make a monster that would actually, you know, and I'm like, doesn't matter. It's a cheat. I just want to see someone pedaling, you know, as they pull back the curtain, so to speak. Um, and Joe Sitka, another phenomenal talent. Um, he, uh, he, he and I would have long, so we basically rewrote the whole script as we went um, because we would have these great story session. He's a, he's a storyteller and filmmaker at heart too. 
A hundred percent. And like again, speaking to him was absolutely incredible because the Loch Ness monster is definitely one that stands out to us as being an absolute favourite. Next question was, I, you know, you were touching on the Loch Ness monster movie there, and that's something that I wanted to kind of discuss even further because for me that was definitely my favourite ever Scooby movie. I think when we did get to speak to Joe Sictor, I think I ended up getting tearful in part of it when they were talking about kind of the concept and everything. It genuinely was such an amazing movie. What was it like? I know you were saying that, you know, it was a movie that meant a lot to you as well. There was a lot of key things you wanted to include. What was what was been part of that movie like? Um, it was to date still one of the highlights of my career. I, I don't think I've ever had as much fun um working with someone uh and working with Joe on um, everything from the story to the designs, you know, as you know, uh, it included a CGI Loch Ness monster, which was also new for Scooby Doo. And um, again, at the time, it was it was pretty groundbreaking and pretty impressive. Um, of course, twenty years later, you look back and go, "Okay, it was okay," you know. But at the time, it was huge. Um, and th the the whole process to me was was the way the process should be. In other words, it was coming from a, a, a true desire to, you know, certainly to entertain, but to tell a story that that made sense and that, you know, we were hyper aware of of the audience. I mean, I just kept putting myself in the position of being, you know, seven years old, and what would I want to see, and what would be. You know, the whole chase sequence with Shaggy and Scooby and the and the Loch Ness Monster in the rain. Um, I mean, that was so choreographed by Joe. And it, it you can just feel it. You can just again, I go back to the, you know, the audience experience. You can feel the fun everyone was having, you know, and that to me is the biggest achievement is to be able to communicate that that excitement and that fun on screen. Um I, I honestly didn't want it to end. I loved doing it so much. Um, and I kept thinking, we should do a sequel. We should go back. There's not just one, you know. Oh, that was also, I think, one of the first times that, no, we're not the, I, sorry. It wasn't one of the first times, but we purposely have that last shot, them driving away and seeing the tail in the, in the water, you know. Is it a monster? Is there a sturgeon? Is it a seal? You know, um, I think anyone who lives in Inverness will will say, you know, you just don't know. There's there's strange things going on there. No, that's true. You never do know. But um, I know as well, like as we say, we did speak to Joe and he actually showed us his initial pitch for the movie. Um, in your experience, what makes a successful movie pitch? That's a great question. Um, I would say there's a couple of things. The number one thing for me is the ending. And this is something I talk a lot about with, um, you know, students or, or writers or other development executives that when I think about the most satisfying films um, or books or, you know, I suppose any media, but the most satisfying stories um, it's those that have the most satisfying ending. And generally for me, a satisfying ending is um, unexpected, but ultimately inevitable. And it's getting there by way of a twist, you know. Um, and backing up from that, I would say what makes a great pitch is when you can be hooked right from the start and you're already, from the moment someone starts pitching you, you're already sort of trying to fill in the blanks. So you're like, oh yes, yes, yes. And, and, and you want to fill in the blanks because that's what an audience member does. You know, when you get hooked and you're like, yes, show me this, show me this, show me this. And then you get to, you know, that, that satisfying ending that, that is generally a surprise. And you're like, of course, that's the ending. Um, so that all comes down to really good storytelling, I guess. And um, and Joe is actually a master storyteller. He's really good at telling a story. Um, but the other thing is, um, and this is, there's a fine line between being relatable and familiar and feeling completely new. 
Um, generally, pitches I've heard um, that are unsuccessful are either too familiar, like we've seen it before, um, or they're just not relatable. Like that may be interesting, but I, I don't connect to it in any way. Um, and not saying things have to be about my, you know, or akin to my life experience, but from an emotional standpoint, it's got to be relatable. And even we're talking about Scooby-Doo, there's got, I think having an emotional connection um, to the story, you know, whether it's to Sh Scooby and Shaggy conquering their fear and saving the day, or it's, you know, Daphne's cousin and what she's up against, you know, whatever it may be, there's got to be an emotional connection because otherwise it's just a sequence of events and it's really hard to be invested in it, you know? Um, one of the things we never did, and they may have since, but we never did that I, I kept toying with and, and wishing we could have done something with it is the gang having a falling out. It was the one thing that as we evolved them, I was thinking, wouldn't it be cool in terms of relatability and, and you know, elevating it, if they were so human that they actually had a falling out, you know, that they they had a big disagreement or a misunderstanding and they parted ways and then it became sort of this ultimately this reunion. Because one thing about Scooby-Doo, um, the the characters uh, and, you know, Ed and, and Jim and um, George on the series, and I talked about this a lot, they literally are like five parts of one character. If you think of them as a character, you know, that you've got the brain and the body and the soul and the imagination. And, you know, they, they, they kind of form this perfect character together. And in isolation, they sort of need each other, you know, to, to come together. Um, and it was from that notion that I, I always have toyed with the idea of a a big falling out, the end of Mystery Inc., the end of the Scooby Gang. They're just, you know, we've had it, we're done. And then some big event kind of brings them back together. And they, you know, all paths lead to, you know, the Scooby Gang. And then they, you know, resolve the differences. Because it's one of the things that I think makes for interesting characters is conflict. And rarely do we have conflict amongst the group or conflict resolution. Um, and I think that just may be a cool place to go someday. Well, I know personally that kind of reminds me of the first live action film sort mm -hmm. of played with that, where the gang split up at the beginning and they had to be brought back together. But I think doing it Actually, in animation... You know what? You, you, Dan, you're probably right. I've sort of blocked out <laughs> the live action films. Sorry. <laughs> I'm, yeah. I know that's fine. Um, but yeah, and just in terms of writing, I know the show spoke to Temple Matthews, um, the writer of Aloha Scooby Doo, and who mentioned talk there was talks of a Scooby movie set in Rio during the carnival. Do you have any memory or additional information about the behind the scenes of that film at all? Um, well, Temple, um, who did a great job with Hello Aloha Scooby Doo, um, we talked about a bunch of different Scoobies over the course of it. Um, um, post uh, Aloha Scooby Doo, um, the challenge. The challenge with a lot of the ideas that would come up um, would be in finding finding a title or or in this case a, a location um, or an event that Warner Home Video, who is funding these, would approve. And so, <clears throat> and they had a lot at stake in this because they were you know expensive and they needed to make sure that they were it was going to be something that they would be able to sell and market globally. Um, and so a lot of possible ideas were were broached and then shot down for various business reasons. Um, and again, with success, you know, there was more and more opportunity to kind of push the envelope. But um, that just never 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 made it past the discussion um, phase. Okay, and I know you just mentioned location there. Was there a, also maybe a type of monster that was discussed for a movie or an episode that never came into fruition? Was there any bans on that? Um, no, the one, the one sort of rule we had was we were trying not to retread on other, you know, places we had gone um, 
in other films or um, once the series was off the ground in the series. Um, well, the, you know, two of the biggest challenges with the the series doing it, you know, the number of episodes that we did were coming up with, you know, the monster or the scare or whatever it was. Um, the other one was um, coming up with the crime because, you know, we're we're telling stories to six to eleven year olds, and when you start looking at crime, most crime is connected to sex or violence. And if you take out sex and violence, um, which doesn't really have a place on you know children's TV, you're you're left with theft. So if you notice, almost every plot in Scooby Doo has to do with greed or thievery, um, because the rest are just off limits, you know. And things like you know, jaywalking or or <laughs> traffic tickets aren't that exciting. Um, so. Yeah, it'd definitely be interesting to see a take on Scooby Doo where they're just driving around in the mystery machine, like waiting for people to start littering, and then they just jump out and like, "Got you." That's what we're gonna <laughs> book you for. So that's a good, a kind of interesting, and glad that that didn't happen. So I think in terms of that whole crime thing, you definitely found the absolute sweet spot in that regard. And in terms of all the movies that you worked on for Scooby Doo. Is there maybe one or even a select few that you stick to and you think that they're like particularly memorable? Um, well, I will say the Monster of Mexico is uh, particularly memorable because um, I don't know if you'll recall, but there's a scene when um, the gang has traveled to visit Alejo um, and they meet his family and he says, oh, please say hello to my family. And he names all these kids in the pool. Uh, those are all my nieces and nephews. <laughs> um, and the reason there are so many of them is because I have a lot of nieces and nephews. Um, but uh, I promised them all that they would be in a Scooby-Doo video. So that scene, at one point, somebody wanted to cut it. And somebody else was like, Oliver, Oliver's not a very Hispanic sounding name. And I'm like, don't touch it, you know. Um, <laughs> But um, there was a great, a great anecdote after it was released and it was out in Mexico. Um, my niece, uh, Gabby, uh, took the video to school to show her friends and say that, you know, this is her. And they all called her a liar. And she called me from Mexico crying, asking if I could come to her school and tell them all that it's real. Um, it was very, very moving. Um, but what's funny now is all those kids who are in that pool are all grown and have their own kids and are all saying, you know, that th my my grand nieces and nephews are like, how come you don't make another one with me in it? You know, <laughs> um, but so that one's very special to me. Um, and I'm going to say something that uh, I've never said publicly before, um, but in every Scooby-Doo movie that I worked on, there are nods to The Wizard of Oz, my favorite film ever. Um, and in fact, little dialogue tributes. So there's your Easter eggs. You can go mm -hmm. watch them. You're like, just go and watch them now. Yeah, that's actually, <laughs> that's going to be a challenge. I like we are that. watching them now. Yeah, we have oh. to. <laughs> well, I, and some of it's just tiny snippets of dialogue that I put in for my own satisfaction so for example in uh you mentioned aloha scooby-doo at one point they go to visit a sort of you know um uh mystical woman who's gonna you know tell them their fortune or and she says um it's so kind of you to visit me in my loneliness which is a line from the wicked witch of the west and the wizard of oz but you know little 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 easter eggs like that because i figured someday when i'm dead and buried somebody could you know edit them all together and basically have the wizard of oz no i'm kidding <laughs> that's so fun i'm surprised i've not noticed it more because the wizard uh, like the wizard of oz is like it was one of my favorite movies um my gran got me a special edition of it kind of with red light ruby slippers on the front cover and things like that i used to love it i can't believe we've not had this conversation I think there before. is like a lion and tigers and bears thing in the <laughs> legend of the vampire one, yeah. definitely i think it's in the vampire one so the cogs there's, are turning now <laughs> there's one in every film 
<laughs> oh my gosh I can't wait to go back through them um and I guess that covers the movies but I mean in relation to episodes is there any particular episode from what's new that stands out to you the most oh gosh um <laughs> no there's not a particular episode um but I will say um no, there's not a particular episode that stands out as, oh, that was my favorite episode, as much as I was continually impressed with how inventive um, the guys were with, you know, plot twists and and clues. And I mean, this these were three writers who cared so much about story structure and about the mystery and about placement of clues and tracking the clues and tracking each character's role in the story in a way that they did it much better than I ever did overseeing the writing on the films like they and they were doing it on a weekly basis so I was continually impressed with with how inventive and and unique every episode could be you know just one after another you know and in such a condensed time frame um so you know it, as a whole I would say I was just blown away by the scripts mm. I think like you said the inventiveness with that show certainly came through I think with villains and here's where JV is going to tell me I've got it completely wrong but like the Scooby snack monster and things like that where they go to the Scooby snack factory and to kind of come up with those unique villains as opposed to just being vampires and zombies and things like that from legend to start creating things completely standalone I think was certainly very impressive very creative and just says a lot about the show as you know a mark of how good it is because obviously now we're 20 years on it's just had its 20th anniversary and it's still to most people the most loved Scooby-Doo show it also still airing on TV to this day more than some of the even more recent shows that have happened since then so how does it feel for you just to kind of see how well it has lasted the test of time? Um, well, when I first got heard from you guys and you you mentioned you wanted to do an interview in connection with the 20th anniversary, I thought, it's been 20 years? Like, <laughs> where, where did that time go? Um, that's, that's pretty remarkable. Um, and the fact that it stands up um, and is still, you know, watched and enjoyed by people is, is so enormously satisfying and... Um, and truly, as I say, a tribute to all the people who worked on it, because people gave their their heart and soul um, in. And it was just, it, you know, I I'd love to say I'd love to say that, you know, oh, but it was so hard. And, you know, it really wasn't. It was it was a labor of love. Like everybody loved doing it. I loved doing it. Um, and. It was a lot of work and an enormous amount of work, but it was just so worth it, uh, you know, at the time. And to know that that continues is and that people are still enjoying it is is so gratifying, so gratifying. Yeah, so it's been absolutely incredible having you here. Like we say, we're huge fans of your Scooby-Doo projects. Um, do you have any upcoming projects that you could share with us or that you could tease? Um, well, I'm not sure if you are aware, I currently work for Mattel, um, and uh, not unlike Scooby-Doo, um, having a heyday, I'm currently executive producing multiple Barbie projects and um, have spent the last, uh, gosh, um, seven, six or seven years uh, kind of reinventing Barbie content, whether it's films or series. Um, and I'm currently working on seven different productions at the same time, a number of uh, what we call specials that are roughly 70 minutes, um, a, an original series um, that is, uh, um, well, two original series, sorry. Um, we've did one uh, just launched recently called It Takes Two. Before that, there was... Um, uh, the introduction of a uh, second Barbie. Um, so we have blonde Malibu Barbie, and uh, we now have Brooklyn Barbie. And Brooklyn um, is a black character. The two are both named Barbie Roberts and meet by chance in a film called 
big city, big dreams. And we now have them as sort of best friends um, in a number of different specials and, and films and animated series. So a lot of Barbie happening. And uh, as we were talking about Scooby-Doo um, having its sort of heyday, um, boy, oh boy, my my days are filled with a lot of Barbie. Um, but it's, it's really an honor because it's, you know, Barbie's another character icon who has been around uh, longer than Scooby-Doo and has has really in the last within the last decade um, had her place in the zeitgeist shift dramatically where she's stopped being the brunt of jokes and is now sort of leading the way in some arenas in terms of talking about you know girl empowerment and you know, imagining all the possibilities for for all the girls out there. Um, so it's been, really been an interesting journey. Um, I started out, frankly, at not a Barbie fan, and now I'm her biggest advocate. Um, so, so if you haven't seen any Barbie lately, check it out. Big City, Big Dreams, which I also co-wrote in addition to uh, producing. It's a musical on Netflix. Well, I know I'm looking forward to the new live action Barbie with Margot Robbie coming out. So I'll I'll definitely make sure to check out your work as well. It definitely sounds like you've got a full schedule. Is there like a place best to keep up with your work? Do you have a website or social media? Uh, I don't any longer while working at Mattel. Um, but you know, certainly uh, IMDb seems to keep pretty good dibs on on all that goes on for me. That's absolutely incredible. And that does conclude all of the questions that we had for you today. I just wanted to thank you so much for how generous you've been with your time today. And of course, if your schedule, like it really genuinely does mean the whole world to us growing up on watching you Scooby-Doo, absolutely loving the work you've done. And then to have such an in-depth conversation with you about Scooby-Doo and your career, it's been absolutely incredible for us. So thank you so much for that. Well, JB, Millie, Darren, Dan, thank you guys so much for having me. It's been a lot of fun. Um, and I can't wait to go watch all the other interviews. Oh, thank you. So I'll definitely have to send you our, our What's New Scooby Doo interview link um, in, in emails. So I guess for the purpose of wrapping up the video, Dan, where can people find you on the internet? Um, the best place to find me on Twitter and Instagram at danfaz 84 well, thank you so much. I'll leave that in the description down below, of course, along with our link tree. So if you do want to see more interviews, then please like, comment and subscribe and we'll see you next time.